in addition to the difficult issues that have been with us since the beginning of the lawyer-client relationship, our modern technological age also creates new complex issues every day. For example, should a lawyer anxious to be able to build her client base be allowed to offer her legal services with a Groupon? I faced this question when a, one of the new Texas lawyers asked me why she wasn't being allowed to advertise with the Groupon at one of the addresses I gave to new lawyers. These are complicated issues, and I just don't think that our advertising rules committees have caught up with the modern technology. You'll be glad to know that if you practice in New York, however, you may market your services with a deal of the day or a group coupon but only with certain caveats, like requiring certain disclosures that a lawyer-client relationship will not be created until the lawyer checks for conflicts and determines her own competency. So Groupon away with that assurance. <laughs> Other technological advances further complicate our application of ethical rules. For example, would you think that a judge may participate in social networking and have a Facebook account without violating rules of conduct? There are all sorts of articles being written about this today. I think in one of them, I am listed as a frequent social networker. This could not be a good thing. In some jurisdictions, a judge may not add friends as friends, court staff, law enforcement officers, social workers, attorneys, and others who may appear before the court. Other jurisdictions have said this is entirely fine. We are in flux in these areas of technology and how we should treat them. The Oklahoma Judicial Ethics Advisory Panel says a judge must accept restrictions on the judge's conduct that might be viewed as burdensome by the ordinary citizen and should do free so freely and willingly. I am willing to do so freely and willingly, but I do think that our ethics rules people will catch up with our next generation who don't really think there's a particular friendship in being a friend on Facebook. Anyone that you can unfriend with a click is not too much of an entanglement. <laughs> Furthermore, there might be some transparency goals being met by allowing people to know who the friends of the judge are rather than keeping those secret for secret meetings and coffees if you're, in, if you're, in, if you're concerned that the judges are going to have secret friends. In addition to the complex issues that surround these, these technological issues, conflicts has created cottage industry of ethical issues as well. We have firms are suing one another over all sorts of conflicts issues, trying to get them get each other conflicted out in many jurisdictions, some for business purposes, some for ethical purposes, maybe some for both. We've had an intersection with this in our court system as well, as people who have served as free interns are calling us and asking for a detailed list of all the cases that they've worked on while they worked for us so that they can give it to their new firm to check for conflicts. Fortunately, there are also ethical obligations that judges face about their work and the privacy thereof, and we have been instructed not to comply with such requests. But this certainly puts the young student who is desperately trying to get a job in a, in a difficult position. Acting ethically in the age of complex, complex conflicts of interest issues requires constant and careful attention. And this is where Professor Fortney's continued contribution to scholarship and legal ethics are sorely needed. Professor Fortney has already contributed a wealth of creative and critical ideas to solving ethical issues. As just one example, in her article in the Georgetown Journal of Legal Ethics, Taking Empirical Research Seriously, How Lawyers Use Empirical Research on the Legal Profession, she observed how empirical research can bridge the divide between theory, social science, and the ethical practice of law. She has often used surveys in her own studies and analyses, and she has written numerous articles exposing and clarifying new issues in legal ethics and proposing novel approaches for dealing with them. Moreover, as a former practitioner, of which very few distinguished professors are these days, I say that with respect, but with notice, she recognizes that the scholars need to intersect and interact with the practitioners. 
Professor Fortney has written an interesting article dealing with one of the biggest ethical problems facing civil practitioners today. In I Don't Have Time to Be Ethical, Billable Hour Pressure and the Ethical Associate, she describes what she calls the Billable Hours Derby and reports in a survey of young associates that almost 50% of them are concerned that if they ethically bill their time, they will not make partner. Far from being an academic exercise or an unrealistic law school hypo, these are examples of real ethical issues that sooner or later will face many practicing attorneys, and Professor Fortney is already researching both in the scholarly and empirical manner on these topics. Professor Fortney has also written thoughtfully about the conflicts that lawyers face as they try to balance their duties to the profession and the public good, and their duties of confidentiality, some of the same issues that Professor Friedman struggled with in the 1960s. She has also written on different business models for practitioners and how they affect the practice of law as a profession, and specifically how they affect clients' recourses against bad lawyers. Some serious legal ethical problems defy simple solutions and remain with us despite the best efforts of our legal ethical forefathers. Moreover, new ethical issues appear every day arising from this fast-paced technological and increasingly global world. And with time pressures, I will not discuss how the globalization of the practice affects ethical issues, which would be a four-hour lecture, and I think some of you may want to go to the reception. These changes require innovative approaches, and it is important that we may remain nimble and alert as those who study and practice in this profession, which we all love so dearly. I close now with some simple and profound thoughts from three Texas Supreme Court justices of another era who wrote in what we belovedly call our Texas Lawyers' Creed as follows. The conduct of a lawyer should be characterized at all times by honesty, candor, and fairness. In fulfilling his or her primary duty to a client, a lawyer must be ever mindful of the profession's broader duty to the legal system. We must always be mindful that the practice of law is a profession. As members of a learned art, we pursue a common calling in the spirit of public service. Let us now, as a profession, each rededicate public confidence in our profession, faithfully serve our clients, and fulfill our responsibility to the legal system. Congratulations to Professor Susan Fortney on her installation at this convocation of the, as the Howard Lichtenstein Distinguished Professor of Legal Ethics. Although we face serious issues with profound implications, I know that we are in very good hands with the very distinguished Susan Fortney. Thank you.